What was Venice Beach before? Human language is uh, arguably one of the great miracles of evolution. And you know, if we, if we could speak, all of us, just the one language, you'd still say to you know, whoever is responsible for evolution, like, great job, it's pretty, it's pretty spectacular. Uh, but in fact, of course, we can speak two, three, four, five languages. It's this extraordinary thing that we are able to do. And, uh, and when we learn a second language, something quite surreal happens. So let's say you're in a foreign town, before you've learned the language and someone comes up to you and they say a sequence of words, but those words sound very, very fast and you can't tell the gaps between them and it's all a bit of a gobbledygook. It kind of sounds something like <laughs> And that's what it is phenomenologically as you're trying to listen. Uh, and then let's say you actually learn a second language and you come back uh, six months later, say, and you know the language and they say the exact same sequence of sounds um, it will appear to you completely differently. They'll be like, excuse me, mate, your car is on fire. I think you should deal with it. <laughs> and this, this miraculous thing that we go from nonsense to a very, very rich experience is surely one of the great treasures of possible human consciousness. Uh, but it is incredibly difficult. And so, uh, you know, 500 million people are currently learning a language. And, you know, most of them do so either in a class or through some uh, device, such as a textbook or an app, which applies a kind of similar philosophy. And that basic philosophy, in some, is kind of trying to pipe information into the brain, maybe by sprinkling some fun on. Uh, and believe me, I love piping information into the brain. I once um, learned a 1,000 French words in a day. Uh, it wasn't a great day. Um, it would have been better if I'd had a drink or something. Uh, but it is possible, and it is potentially quite fun. When you learn like this in a classroom setting, something doesn't really work very well. And a recent piece of research has actually shown that in classrooms, people tend to learn at an average speed over the course of seven years of three words per hour. Now, three words per hour is, would be a good rate for a kind of motivated African gray parrot. But for a human being, we can do a lot better. And surely there must be like a much better way of doing this. And it turns out there is a much better way, and it's been known for thousands of years, which is that in the arms of a giving lover, who's also a monoglot in their own language, uh, one learns astonishingly fast. Like, if one could beam oneself back to Paris circa 1970, and uh, in the arms of one's choice of Brigitte Bardot or Alain Delon, and uh, just spend seven days in such a situation, it's difficult to believe that one wouldn't actually learn more French than one achieves in seven years of high school study. Now, this is a quite astonishing thing. A situation in which one isn't even trying to learn can and frequently is almost 100 times more powerful than a situation where the whole job is to learn. You could call this like the paradox of experiential learning. When we're not trying to learn, when we're having fun, when we're enchanted by the outside world, we can pick up enormous amounts of information incredibly fast. And so the fundamental bit which lies behind this is that the boredom and learning are flip sides of the same coin. They are kind of, they're, they're almost directly opposites. When you're bored, almost by definition you're not learning, and when you're learning, almost by definition you're not bored. And so the question, of course, is, is like, how do we get people not to be bored by learning? One of the best ways of doing that is that one can look at what happens when people are really enjoying the experience of language. And if you actually go out there and ask language learners, you know, what's wonderful about learning a language, they'll tell you a sequence of things which would include things like this. So they'll tell you that freedom from their personality is a wonderful thing when you learn a language. And I particularly like this when beginning a language. You know, I was in um, a cafe in Antwerp. I speak terrible Flemish. I was like, in the cafe in Antwerp the other day, and I, you know, roughly in the experience of the waiter who was serving me, I was like, saying, like, I go spoon. <laughs> and he was like, mm, yes, my child. Uh, speak to me. Anyway, we eventually established that I wanted to go to the men's toilet. Um, but uh, it's a nice experience, actually, to go through this kind of thing. And then when you begin to speak a language better, you often access even more kind of entertaining possibilities. When I'm uh, speaking French, I almost immediately feel uh, like uh, drinking uh, coffee, uh, smoking cigarettes, and uh, talking philosophy. And it's just something which comes over me as soon as I speak like, speaking the language. And when I speak German, I become exceptionally punctual. Um, a second thing is you get new ideas. Yeah, this picture is of some people walking into the mouth of a wolf. And I was telling an Italian friend that I was coming to America to give a talk, and she was like, oh, that's very exciting. Uh, in, in Bocca da Lupo. 
which I could more or less translate as like in the mouth of the wolf. And I thought for a second, there's something going on in Venice Beach that I don't know about. But they seem to have a similar phrase to break a leg in America, another connection which we have um, in England as good luck. Uh, in Italy, Italy, it turns out you don't want to say good luck because that brings bad luck. Um, this happens in loads of different ways. So, for instance, um, in Russian, there are two different words for blue, for light blue and dark blue. And when you learn to speak the language, you have to pay attention to this difference. And in Slavic languages, quite entertainingly, um, they don't make the distinction verbally between toes and fingers. They're just all fingers. And so if you grow up in a Slavic country, you have a really nice sense of embodiment where you have foot fingers. And I think walking is probably a little bit more fun. Another great thing about learning a language is that you get new concepts. So I was at uh, breakfast one time with my friend Fabian in Berlin, and he was like, yeah, Eddie, can you give me the Eierschalen Sollbruchstellen für Ursache? And I was like, what was that, Fabi? Ah, the Eierschalen Sollbruchstellen für Ursache. I was like, sounds really good. What is it? He's like, let's break it down. Eierschalen, eggshells, Sollbruchstellen, the optimum position for breaking an object, für Ursache, too. And I was like, Fabian, what has this got to do with breakfast? And then he showed me this amazing implement, which has revolutionized my life. Uh, this is uh, indeed an Eierschalen Sorbostellen für Ursache. You, um, you place it on the top of the egg. You take up the ball bearing. You allow it to slide by gravity down the shaft. And it breaks the top of the egg in the most sublime fashion. Uh, and that has completely revolutionized my uh, morning routine. So this is another thing people love about learning a language, is you get to learn new concepts, new patterns of behavior. Uh, you also get to learn new forms of thought. Uh, this, these are the Pimperawa people who were studied by a scientist called Lyra Boroditsky in northwestern Australia. And they uh, communicate cardinal, they communicate direction, not as we do, like it's on your left, it's in front of you, it's on your right, uh, but instead by compass direction. So um, I might say, ah oh, yes, the audience is mainly to my uh, northwest at the moment. Uh, and if something's on my right foot, depending on which way I'm pointing, I might be, oh, it's on my eastern foot, or alternatively I'd be, oh, it's on my southern foot. Uh, and so this is quite an entertaining thing. And in order to learn this, in order to be able to speak with this, as a speaker of this language, you have to constantly pay attention to compass direction. And therefore, your whole experience of space and time is transformed. I really enjoy this also, actually, uh, in just the very subtleties of a language. You know, when in uh, German, for instance, um, they have quite elaborate forms of word order, which can produce quite a lot of meaning and amusement. Because as you're going through a sentence, it's quite unclear what the sentence is eventually going to mean. It's just like, you know, I have for two days in the mornings with great pleasure <laughs> my eggshell breaker optimal position tool on my boiled eggs get used. And you're like, okay, very good. Um, <laughs> nice sentence. The penultimate thing about language is that it actually increases your sense of empathy. Empathy, you know, has been said to be seeing through the eyes of another, hearing through the ears of another, and feeling with the heart of another. And of course, when you're learning a language, this is kind of almost exactly what you're kind of learning to do. And quite a cool recent study with uh, bilingual children has shown that they're better able to basically mentally rotate their position and take into the perspective of others um, what's going on than they would be if they were only spoke one language. There's an actual direct causal connection. It's pretty cool. And a final thing, of course, which is the most obvious thing, is that you know, when you speak another language, it unlocks all of these rich and interesting experiences. You get to be quite good value in a Greek bar. You get to travel uh, more richly. And you get to open your curiosity to more parts of the world. This morning, I was just outside, and I, kind of, I was getting my speech together at the last minute, and I was kind of muttering to myself in a way which might you know, have caused concern uh, about my uh, you know, mental health. Anyway, this young lady stopped, and she couldn't be more of a cliche of Venice Beach. You know. Wetsuit, surfboard, bike. And she's like, excuse me, mister, can I just say, it's so great you talk to yourself. I do that too. You should keep on doing that. <laughs> and like, uh, you know, you can only imagine how unpleasant that situation would have been if I didn't speak American. Because um, then I might have thought that she was, you know, whisking me away to uh, an asylum or something. But uh, it, was, it was all cool. So, um, you know, if you look at all these different examples of what actually produces pleasure in language learning, what opens your mind, they all have in common, and if we were to go through them, these new ideas, these new concepts, these new forms of life, this increased empathy, this greater access to enriched experience, they all have in common that they open self and world. And so if we think about like a modern piece of technology, which is actually getting quite close to the Babelfish thing, where, uh, you know, someone can talk to you in any language, and that this thing will live translate it. This is kind of a near-term future possibility if it's not with us already. If you think about like, such a device, it doesn't bring any of the benefits that I'm talking about. It doesn't bring any of this opening up of your world and your experience, any of this freedom from your personality, any of this richness of thought and perception. 
And so that's why it remains quite a good way, idea to, to learn a second language, and it always will. I uh, have a company called uh, Memrise, um, and uh, we've been trying to kind of pipe a little bit of joy into language learning lately. Uh, we began life as a um, kind of optimized memorization tool, a kind of cool piece of tech which could get information into people's brain pretty fast. And that was cool, but then we realized, because people were learning languages, they wanted to bring a bit more joy to proceedings. And so I just want to tell you a couple of stories about what we've uh, gotten up to. And one of the things that we immediately noticed is that we were kind of like a stereotypical tech startup. We were like 12 white men sitting in an office. Um, and it was pretty pathetic, pretty undiverse, and pretty boring. So we decided to mix things up, and we, um, first of all, we radically diversified the team. We found um, people from now 40 different nationalities, 44% uh, uh, female, we're getting to 50%, and all quite entertaining uh, characters. Um, and then shortly before that, we bought a double-decker bus. And so the idea of this double-decker bus, uh, which comes from 1972 and was um, something of a mechanical wreck, was that we wanted to kind of get out of the office and get out among both our language learners and the different languages of Europe and see if we could do something to collect the richness and joy of language as is experienced on the streets. And so we painted the bus. We uh, had a good time doing that. And then we um, did up the inside so it could sleep about seven people. And once we'd done up the inside, we then set out on a tour around Europe. That's the inside. We all slept, uh, seven of us, at the top of the bus. And we set out on a tour around Europe. And this is the itinerary we took. Um, and so here we were. Um, and I have to say, we broke down about there. And so this Eastern European bit is somewhat aspirational. We took a fabulous tour around uh, Europe. And then we, um, what we did is we, we took videos of native speakers on the streets. And they were a mixture of just randomly accosted uh, pedestrians. Have you ever heard the phrase tilting at windmills? And uh, did Don Quixote. Well, this is one of the windmills uh, that, that was being tilted at. Um, FYI. Um, anyway, we had a quite a good time, and um, we created like a video dictionary, the first of, of all the languages. Um, and this is us accosting a random pedestrian, and this is uh, what the video dictionary looks like. And uh, we've now woven this inside the app, and these videos bring a little bit of the magic and the mystery and the joy of people as you actually experience them when you're traveling, actually experience them when you're making friends with, and it's bringing it into our app. This woman was asleep, but we woke her up eventually. Je suis journaliste. Parce que c'est la femme de mes rêves. Señoras y señores. Salud. A pratica leva perfection. Bon dia. Capisci? Accettate carte. Das ist mein Hund. Danke. Holut. Will er mir öl? Prosit. Du ole. Das gibt Brot Eublick zu erzählen. So there's a fun kind of set of videos. And what we've done is we've kind of woven them into the learning experience so that the learning is no longer um, learning like phrases and vocabulary and so on and so on but is instead sort of encountering these fun people. So we've now got, a, we have got the luck to have about 25 million people using the app, and it's going pretty well. But recently we realized that we were doing a good job of opening up the world to other people, but not such a good job of opening up ourselves to the world. And I found this in my incipient efforts to learn Chinese, where despite all of my supposed openness of soul, I was finding these people very, very weird looking, and finding it um, very like a very distant prospect that I might ever sound like these people sounded. And um, one of the things about a diverse approach to creation is that people come up with ideas you know, you don't, might not think of yourself. And I personally disapprove of karaoke. I think it's uh, the first signs of decadence in a society. Um, but uh, one, of my, uh, one of my team is a big karaoke fan. And so we developed this mode, which is quite entertaining, where um, you dub your voice over the face of someone who maybe looks a bit like they're from a distant land and the rest of it. And you hear your voice coming out of their face. <laughs> And this is a kind of rudimentary form of virtual reality. Um, but it's a really fun one. And when you do it, you suddenly have this experience. It's just like, oh, wow, even though I'm not Chinese, I can sound Chinese. The overall thing here is that, uh, you know, in our society, we have this, like, persistent and somewhat preposterous concept that we are computers and that when we learn, we have to, like, encode information and process information. And this is a very dominant metaphor, which feeds a lot of our assumptions about how we should become educated and how we should experience the world. But, of course, we're not computers, and we don't resemble any of the computers which have yet been invented. Uh, you know, what we do process, if it's anything, is experience. And when it's possible to create experiences which have the full richness of human life, which have all of the fun and openness and strangeness and humor of actual experience, it's possible to use those to create learning experiences which are kind of fundamentally more humane and which probably do a dramatically better job. Thank you very much.